Before we uh, start, I'd like to inform uh, some of you, uh, I think most of you already know, but yesterday we lost uh, Nigar Ahmed uh, at the age of 72. She was one of Pakistan's most inspiring and iconic uh, social workers. She was the, uh, one of the moving spirits uh, at the Women's Action Forum and she was the founder of Aurat Foundation. So I'd like to just mark a moment's silence in respect for Nigar Ahmed. Fake news. Originally, fake news was a term that meant news that is not news. It's completely unreliable propaganda, misinformation. During last year's uh, US presidential election, fake news was used to describe the propaganda machinery against Hillary Clinton, mobilized by allegedly the Russians, uh, a 400 pound man in his father's basement in New Jersey, and the sort of stories you saw about Hillary Clinton, um, that she was running a child sex ring with John Podesta in the basement of a pizza place in Washington, D.C., that she is secretly violently ill and she has to have her bodyguard inject her with stuff just to keep her upright and that she was having an affair with Yoko Ono in the 70s. All of this was platformed on social media and Facebook but nobody challenged it because they assumed thinking rational people would treat this propaganda as propaganda. So the New York Times, CNN, the fake media, uh, they ignored this, assuming the best of their audiences and the best of readers, but quite clearly, uh, a lot of people bought into the fake news that was anti-Hillary and by default pro-Trump. I believe the Yoko Ono rumor, I was very excited about it. I thought it made Hillary cool finally. Trump has now reappropriated the term fake news. Fake news and very fake news, as he's up, upgraded his, uh, his term, is now being used by this White House to erode the credibility of mainstream media in the US that is critical of the Trump administration, whether it's his executive orders, uh, whether it's uh, his business ties, uh, whether it's his weekend golfing at Mar-a-Lago. In a lot of ways, the Trump playbook is, is replicating what Pakistan has been going through itself. Uh, they're really just catching up to how the media landscape is and the relationship between the state and the private sector media in Pakistan. We have here uh, an August panel. We have Ahmed Rashid, the best-selling author of uh, Taliban. Uh, we have Nermeen Sheikh, who is uh, at Democracy Now!, we have Mr. Max Roddenbeck, he's an academic and a journalist, he's based in Cairo. And we have Qasim Numan, uh, who's a journalist based in Islamabad. Uh, Ahmed, I'll just open this up to you. Fake news, what's up? Well, I think the, you know, the real danger of this fake news and something we've experienced in Pakistan also, but particularly now coming out of America, is, is the danger to the American media and free expression. Uh, I, I belong, uh, I'm on the board of governors of an organization called the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, it's a New York-based um, organization and CPJ spent, has spent most of its time until now rescuing journalists in endangered countries like Syria and Afghanistan and even Pakistan. Right now, CPJ is, is having to devise a whole new strategy to deal with abuse of the media by the Trump administration. And the, the, the fact that the American media is now seeing itself in danger um, of, of censorship, of uh, being, for, being abused by uh, the President of the United States, um, I think is an absolutely extraordinary development and something that's very, very difficult to cope with. Um, we've had periods of very intense uh, press censorship, martial law, um, and, and false narratives, if you like. I mean, the last bomb that exploded in Lahore, it's still not clear if it was a bomb or a cylinder exploding, although I'm pretty convinced it was um, a bomb. 
Um, one of Trump's aides has called alternative facts that um, we don't believe in the real facts of what happened. Uh, we believe in an alternative fact. So I think, you know, the, the, the danger, if, if, if American media is censored and restricted, we are going to see more of that in Europe, in, uh, amongst right-wing regimes, in the Muslim world, and uh, there are huge dangers ahead. Nermeen has been at the forefront of uh, challenging some of the uh, uh, measures that the Trump administration took as part of democracy now. Nermeen, what's your take on this? You know, um, before we uh, talk about uh, Trump, which uh, both Ahmed and, and Fassi have, uh, have uh, talked about what he's done as president and during his campaign, I, I want to mention another aspect uh, of the media, uh, and namely that is, uh, the role the media played in allowing Trump to be where he is. And I'm not talking about the right-wing media, I'm not talking about Fox News at all. And I'll, I'll just say something about a, a report uh, that was uh, published last year, which looked at the coverage that each of the presidential candidates received on the three main uh, uh, networks in the US, uh, namely C, uh, CBS, ABC and NBC. The Tyndall report found that in 2015, of 1,000 minutes of coverage of the campaigns, Trump received almost a third of the coverage, that's 327 minutes, whereas Bernie Sanders received only 20 minutes. Right, so the whole world is wondering, how is it that Trump came to occupy the most powerful position in the world. And I'm afraid in that, the media, fake or not, simply because of its power, uh, had a large role uh, to play in it. So when one looks at the falsity of the news, uh, despite, I mean, obviously Trump uses this uh, uh, term uh, only in a self-exonerating uh, and self-aggrandizing way, uh, we also have to look at why that's so significant, because whatever the media produces uh, is not only taken uh, as true, although it, now it's the case that something like 75% of Americans distrust the news, uh, it, it's not only taken uh, or was taken as true, but it also plays a very important role in determining events. In other words, because the media, not just in the US, but all over the world with 24-hour news channels and an endless array of uh, social media uh, news uh, sites uh, online, uh, as well as newspapers, you know, we're kind of inundated uh, with information that tells us how to think and what's significant about what occurs and also elides or erases other events that aren't deemed as significant. Uh, so that's uh, one point. The second thing is that uh, given the kind of uh, uh, dominance and ubiquity of the media and its power, I, I could for myself say that uh, I've been somewhat of a reluctant journalist, to bo borrow uh, Mohsen Hamid's uh, uh, title of his book. And I remember uh, reading uh, George uh, Bernard Shaw's, and I'll just paraphrase here, line where he said that uh, newspapers, and now one can substitute the media, the media seems unable to distinguish between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. Now, what did he mean by that? It's that in the sheer immediacy of the coverage that's required of the media, and even more so now, it's like minute by minute, second by second, the news is almost, uh, uh, the news necessitates certain erasures. In other words, there are always things that cannot be said, and the larger frame is almost always exempted from what we're told. And this is especially true uh, in, uh, I have to say, although I think democracy now is an exception, it's uh, especially true in uh, television uh, news. So, you know, Trump's position, as much as we have to think of his really sociopathic uh, lies and, and uh, the positions he assumes, I think it's also very important uh, to emphasize the role that the media plays uh, 
in both determining the course of events and determining how we understand and perceive events. Uh, so in a sense, given that, uh, you know, Trump's proclamations are, uh, or can be, even more damning. Thank you, Nidhi. Max, uh, journalists have agendas. Uh, news organizations do have biases. I think that's, that's fairly clear when we categorize Fox News as being, uh, you know, right-wing or sort of conservative. It's, it's apparent, and that's true globally. Uh, so when Trump criticizes the New York Times and shuns them, takes them out of the, uh, the, the gaggle and, and calls them fake news, it finds traction, it finds resonance. Would you agree with that or do you think it's not as simple as that? So it finds resonance, how do you mean uh, finds resonance? As Nermeen said, 75% of Americans now distrust the media. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a phenomenon that's been growing for a long time, and I think with, with someone like Trump, we have an interesting thing. I mean, we have a, a, a character, as much as he is a politician, that is transitioning from virtual reality, which is his background on television. He was a television host for a long time. Uh, so he's actually in the process of transitioning. Um, and um, I suspect that we'll, we'll, as he transitions and gets a bit boxed in by the American system, he'll become less of a generator of, of fake news, and it'll have to get a little bit more real. Um, uh, yeah, regarding um, the sort of agenda, of course, you know, I mean, media is, is, is it's an art of interpretation as much as a presentation, and inevitably there is some interpretation that goes on. It just depends on how quite how much. I think you know, there's there, there are two aspects to this the, this fake news phenomenon. Uh, one is 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 the the old aspect, and then I, I think uh, as, as Ahmed was saying, there's also a new aspect. I mean. Uh, the, I think the new aspect is that uh, uh, news is increasingly compartmentalized, or at least its consumption is. The consumption of media is getting increasingly compartmentalized. Uh, we used to have broadcasting. You know, a place like the United States used to be more or less controlled by the three big networks. You know? uh, that's absolutely not the case anymore. And now people can, can choose, uh, and it's become a sort of supermarket where you only choose your own brand and, and never deviate uh, from, your, from your brand. And this compartmentalization, this sort of bubbleization, is one of the reasons why the phenomenon of fake news has turned into something. It's a new media landscape that's created that. And of course, the other thing, the other factor in it is technology uh, with the internet and so on and so forth. Uh, your, your capability of choosing things becomes uh, obviously much greater. Uh, so you really didn't, do never need to leave your bubble with using social media, et cetera, et cetera. You, you're with like-minded people all the time. But I think there's another aspect, which is the old aspect, which is we have to not get too overheated. As, uh, I think, as Nirveen was, was, was implying, uh, that, that there's, a, there's a, a long history of fake news. And um, part of the sort of surprise, shock, horror about this is that it's entered the United States, which you know, is the biggest news-generating, uh, trend-generating country in the world. But I think in much of the world, much of the world has been attuned to fake news for a very, very, very long time. You know, uh, I can remember, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, this is, I, I wasn't a participant, but in the 1967 war between Israel and the, the, the Arabs, the so-called Six-Day War, Radio Cairo continued three, four, five days into the war to, be re to report that uh, Egyptian tanks were rolling into Tel Aviv. And there was a famous radio presenter, Ahmed Said, who was the voice of the Arabs at the time. And years afterwards, he, he, he was asked the question, you know, you, were, you kept saying that our tanks were rolling into Tel Aviv. Uh, and yet, uh, 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 the reality was that is, is Israel had marched across the Sinai Peninsula and had walked, marched up to the Suez Canal and trounced the Arabs. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And his answer was, because we deserved to win. You know? And so <laughs> this, this, this sort of instinct to, to uh, 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 what is the word uh, um, I'm, trying, I'm looking for? Um, you know, the need for positive reinforcement is a very human thing. Now people can find it instantly. And you know, also, uh, you know, the, the, there's an aspect to this which is uh, um, also one of the disturbing things, particularly about this Trump administration, before it gets put into its box, which I expect, I suspect it will be, um, is that uh, he is replicating what's been done by dictators all over the world. I mean, this shutting out of major news organizations from his own uh, press conferences is a very, very real thing. And I've seen that myself. I remember being in press conferences with someone like, uh, and another thing is having very long press conferences where you say very little. Uh, and you exhaust people, you just tire their brains out, you know, uh, that's, that's another, another kind of thing. But I, I think, um, 
uh, uh, you know, the idea that uh, you can control and make such a mishmash of, of the news that no one knows which way is up is actually a, an, an old technique practiced by secret police in Russia for a very long time. This is, this is KGB doctrine, actually. How do you control things? You make it, you scramble them so that no one knows which way things are going. And actually, this is one thing that Russia, with Putin's Russia does. I mean, they have, there's, a, there's a building in, in St. Petersburg that we know about where trolls sit and generate lots of junk. Uh, there's another room in the, apparently in the Ministry of Education in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, uh, where trolls of Erdogan do the same thing. You know? um, so uh, in a sense, uh, Donald Trump is picked up from, from these guys. He's a quick study and uh, he's pushing along not dissimilar similar grounds. I'll just say well, one, one last thing, uh, another little memory uh, uh, of how things used to be. Um, I can remember people, people used to ask back in the Cold War days, what is the better representative reality, Pravda? It, the Soviet Union, uh, you know, the, the Russian sort of spoke, uh, mouthpiece for the Communist Party, or the New York Times, which one's more truthful? And uh, I think the, you know, the, 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 the answer after some consideration was that actually Pravda was better because people believed the New York Times. They actually believed it. They believed every word in it. Whereas Pravda, although the, the word means truth in Russian, Russians knew perfectly well you couldn't believe a word in the damn thing and you had to read between the lines and, be, and use your own mind to figure things out. I think this is the sort of stage we're at now of uh, technology has changed very quickly, people's capacity to choose things has changed quickly, perhaps quicker than their capacity to be uh, alert citizens. And I think that's the important thing, is creating citizens that can actually interpret news in, for themselves. That's the key thing. Karsim, what's your take on the phenomenon and how do you relate this to Pakistan? Uh, well, a couple of uh, really interesting points have been made by um, all three panelists, which is uh, the mix of uh, technology, uh, as well as this erosion of trust in what you would previously consider uh, widely as uh, outlets of record, you know, newspapers of record or TV stations of record. Uh, what technology has done, and I'm speaking as, uh, as a working journalist where I have, we, you know, we have uh, newsrooms trying to churn out news by, you know, every 24-hour cycle. And I can't overstate the stress that the, uh, the proliferation of not fake news, but all kinds of information has had through Twitter or Facebook or other outlets. Uh, I'll give you a very, uh, an example from Pakistan, for example. Uh, uh, a random blog uh, uh, put out a news story saying uh, an American, a global coffee chain headquartered in the US was going to open several outlets in Pakistan. Uh, this instantly was retweeted about 2,000 times. Uh, and every major business uh, newspaper in the country or the business pages or business editors were tweeting it, you know, it was published in the papers the next day. Uh, there was one problem. By the time those tweets hit about 10,000 shares, likes, tweets on, on social media, that was the time it took for us regular journalists to reach out to that company and find out whether it's actually true or not. And so that amount of effort that's expended by news organizations, which are, as we know, the global journalism industry is at a crunch, their uh, you know, staffs are being slashed, bureaus are being shut down across the world. Uh, so the stress that's being placed on news organizations to not just do what they were doing before, which is to report the news, find news, break news, but to also make sure that what's being circulated in the media and what people are now increasingly taking to be true is not true, or whether it's true or not to verify it. Um, you know, Fassi mentioned, uh, you know, the context of Pakistan. Even before the U.S. election that brought Trump to power, uh, we had news stories uh, in Pakistani TV uh, stations and, and newspapers claiming things like, uh, a UFO has been sighted, quoting sources, in some random village in Taxila. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little more horrifically, the, the second reported bombing in Lahore a few days ago was something that never even happened. But it was something that was spread out through WhatsApp, through Twitter, through Facebook, uh, causing an immense amount of panic in a city that was already reeling within, from an actual uh, explosion that killed many people. Uh, a pop star was reportedly caught with heroin at Heathrow when the pop star was actually at home with at her son's birthday in Lahore. Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, a news organization with finite resources is up against uh, what are essentially news organizations of their own with a billion users plus. Uh, so, I, so the first point I want to make, both in the context of Pakistan and, and globally, is, uh, is the stress that it's placing and, and how important it is that 
uh, we kind of figure out a way. I'm not, unfortunately, in an editorial management position at a newspaper to figure that out, but it, it's, it's a matter of resources and getting skin in the game to kind of make sure that we, uh, uh, we not just fight uh, fake news, but also regain the trust that's been eroded, as the panelists pointed out, uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, the other problem that I want to highlight is, uh, as Fasi mentioned in Pakistan's context, there's very little accountability for what is reported in, on TV or in the newspapers. You will very rarely, the, the examples that I've given, they're all from the last 18 months. Uh, not one TV channel that I know of actually apologized on the record saying, we made a great, grave error in reporting. This is the procedure that was carried out uh, in, in getting that to air or in print, and we apologize, and we would, you know, because it's to the reader's trust that, that, you, that you play to. Uh, and in Pakistan, the matter of resources is even greater. You know, this is a country where news organizations are struggling to pay salaries on time, let alone have people who are doing quality checks on what's being broadcast or printed. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's something that on an individual level, many journalists in this country have to, to take on. Uh, because like Fussy said earlier, the agendas are, are almost as many as uh, the amount of Twitter accounts you have. In, in Pakistan, so so it's a matter. The, the resource crunch is something that I would like to highlight. As, as um, I just want to take up one, I think, very important point that you mentioned is accountability. The, I mean, my first problem is with tweets. Uh, I don't tweet myself. I refuse to tweet, and and the reason for that is that tweeting allows ministers and generals and people in the government to project the news of their choice, but it does not allow you, the journalist to answer back or to ask a question or to get a briefing. Now, we have this phenomenon now in Pakistan where all sections of the state are using tweets and press conferences are not given anymore. We don't have, we have not had a press conference by the Prime Minister, I think, in three years. Uh, journalists do not have an opportunity to ask questions as to what did you mean by this? Can you add more information about this? Briefings that used to be a regular feature, for example, of the counterterrorism operations in the tribal areas and all, we don't get briefings anymore. We get tweets. And nobody can question a tweet. So I think, I think that is a really dangerous issue. It's, it's just as dangerous as fake news. I think the other big, big problem have, we, we have faced in Pakistan is that um, since the um, uh, publication of the National Action Plan, which was t two years ago, um, we don't have a common narrative. Now, you, you can't build a narrative between all sections of the, of, of the government and the population and the religious leaders and the politicians and the generals and all the rest. You can't build a common narrative through um, tweets. I mean, you have to, first of all, agree on a common narrative and then project it properly through the media. And unfortunately, that is not being done. Today, you know, we, we have extremist groups who are allowed to live in Lahore and live in other places. We have extremist groups who are being chased and killed and, and, and caught. And we don't know who, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, because the good guys can change tomorrow. Um, we have the interior minister, for example, making a statement saying, um, uh, you know, the, the sectarian groups are not as dangerous as the extremist groups. Now, I mean, it's a very weird, very weird assessment, which many people didn't even understand when he said it. But the, the, the failure of having a narrative, the dependence on, over-dependence on technology, means that the traditional craft of journalism, which is to ask questions, is denied us. And, and just to add something and leave it out there for the panel and the audience is this use of uh, Twitter by Pakistani ministers, uh, and bring it back to the topic of fake news, uh, the defense minister of Pakistan, a nuclear armed country, recently fell for a fake news item, yeah. tweeting out a very uh, a, a kind of thinly veiled response to another state, which is Israel, uh, and we've yet to be, you know, get a kind of retraction or any kind of admission that, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I fell for it, I should have been more responsible. I mean, this sounds like uh, technology is actually a problem. I mean, all these platforms, WhatsApp, Twitter, I mean, it's almost sounding like, uh, you know, we should uh, uh, sort of have fewer media outlets. Uh, you know, I, I want to uh, comment on, on what Ahmad said, uh, which is the, the use of uh, 
of Twitter by uh, government officials to project the news of their choice. I mean, it's also, this is the first time in history that the US president, the American president is using Twitter as the principal form, uh, uh, the principal medium uh, to communicate uh, with people. He's also given only one or perhaps two press conferences now the majority of time of which he spent attacking uh, uh, the press who are present. And, and you know, it's not just, uh, as my colleague uh, here uh, uh, suggested as well, it's not a matter only uh, of the medium. Uh, the, the problem is that what is said uh, through this uh, medium, Twitter and, and uh, other forms of social media, they have really grave uh, consequences, especially when they come from the mouth of the US president. Uh, just recently, um, and, and I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with this, uh, <coughs> when Trump issued his first uh, executive order, uh, the travel ban, it was put into effect almost immediately. He signed it on a Friday afternoon. We heard uh, on Friday night uh, Democracy Now! did, that is, that people were already being stopped uh, at U.S. airports. Among those people uh, were Syrian refugees. Now, so much of his campaign uh, was predicated on uh, the, the blame or the fault that lies with immigrants. And that's immigrants, to say nothing of the abuse that he hurled at refugees. And he talked about uh, uh, instituting what he called extreme vetting. And he said repeatedly on Twitter, they're streaming in. We don't know who the hell these people are, et cetera, right? So this gave the impression, which was repeated again and again uh, by him and then by his followers, that people are somehow able to enter the country without anybody asking any questions. Now, the actual effect of this lie and his executive order was that refugees who in fact are subject to the most extreme vetting, people who had built, uh, waited for five years for Syrian refugees, first in Turkish refugee camps, first in Syria displaced, then in Turkish refugee camps, filling out endless forms and being questioned by literally tens of US immigration officers, they having waited all this time fleeing Syria again, not because they wanted to come to the US to eat McDonald's and live off a welfare state that doesn't actually exist, but because their country has been bombed to oblivion, they were denied entry. And some of them at the border on that Friday night, following Donald Trump's executive order on the travel ban, were sent back where they came from. Max, uh I think uh, what Ahmed also pointed out earlier and what Qasim was relaying about I mean, Pakistan almost went to war with Israel because of fake news. And uh, we had uh, a crazy guy with a gun go to the pizza place that, uh, you know, uh, was where allegedly Hillary was running a child sex ring. So as the Democrats have been saying in the US, fake news has real world consequences. And what Ahmed's point was that, you know, I mean, now there is absolutely no accountability because the flow of information is just one way on Twitter and on a lot of these platforms. I mean, they can choose to respond, but they don't. And you're just supposed to print their tweets and go on with it. So in this world with all these platforms and technology actually posing a problem and people being able to bypass the traditional channels of uh, news and information, how do you bring in accountability? But How do you contain the consequences, sorry, of fake news? Yeah, I, I, before answering that directly, I just want to add to something that, that Ahmed was saying. I mean, uh, I think uh, Pakistan is not by far uh, not the only country where you have this phenomenon of the, the head of state using Twitter or, or even America. I mean, next door in, in India, which, by the way, is where I work now. I'm in Delhi, uh, not in Cairo anymore. Um, uh, you have a prime minister who not only communicates entirely through Twitter and never holds a press conference, but he actually has an app you know, the, 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 the Modi app, which uh, is used to do things like take public opinion surveys of whether people approve his, of his policies. But you have to download his app in order to answer the, the question. So, I mean, it's, it sort of answers itself, obviously. Um, 
And I, I think part of the trouble with, with uh, uh, the present age is that, you know, like, as I was saying before, fake news isn't that new. But in a place like America, for example, there used to be things like a newspaper called the National Enquirer or the News of the World, which were filled with idiotic stuff and silly stories and, you know, exactly, precisely fake news as we have it now. It's just that they were in the context of something you bought on a sh supermarket sh shelf because you wanted a little light entertainment, you know. Uh, like the tabloids in, in, in the UK. The trouble is that in the, in the world of social media, things have been decontextualized in a way, so people don't know where things are coming at them from. You know, they've been taken out of their, their box. Um, and so in order to bring credibility back, I think in a way things have to be put back in some kind of recognizable box. And I don't, I don't mean by control or censorship, but as I was saying before about c uh, citizenship, I mean, people have to become more discriminating, which they will. I mean, things will, will, will write themselves to a certain extent by themselves. And I, and I, I think uh, I disagree slightly that Twitter is only one way. That's not entirely true. I mean, of course, the generator of lots of Twitter news doesn't necessarily have to answer specifically. But there is, I mean, on Twitter, there is a great deal of debate. That's what most of what goes on on Twitter is, in fact, is, is debate back and forth. Um, I, think, I think part of the, the, the trouble, more than the lack of uh, a debate on Twitter, because people are constantly questioning on Twitter and forcing politicians to answer, you know, if they get enough volume uh, on Twitter. The, the problem more is that a lot of people don't listen to anything that they don't want to hear, you know. Uh, um, and um, uh, I, I think, you know, this, this move from broadcasting to narrowcasting has happened too quickly for people to sort of, for, for, the, in the, uh, the, for, for the truth to permeate, you know. Uh, it's become too easy to, to disseminate lies, so to speak. Um, but I, I suspect it's a matter of time before, uh, and, unless the world goes completely belly up and we all turn into a sort of virtual, we, we start believing in virtual news uh, uh, of the kind that um, Donald Trump would generate on his television show. Uh, uh, what was it called? Apprentice, right? Where you, you could get, he could fire anyone. Well, he, you know, he got, a, got in his president of the United States and tried to fire the refugees. You know? Uh, and discovered he couldn't quite do that. You know? um, so uh, uh, I just hope we don't get into, we don't end up in a, in a more cartoon-like world. Uh, I mean, I, I am hopeful that we don't. Oh, well, it's an interesting point that you made about, um, uh, you know, kind of allowing people to discern what is, uh, you know, credible information or credible news organization and, and otherwise. Um, I think uh, I just wanted to uh, to put this out there for uh, the panel and the audiences. So, one of the solutions that has been um, considered by some educational researchers in the U.S. and I believe Stanford is one of the universities that is conducting these studies. What they're doing is very interesting. They're asking uh, a sample, a representative sample of students from different grades, uh, what you think is credible news, and and just to test if they're able to tell between what is so absurd as to not be true or uh, based on whether they can recognize if it's from, say, the New York Times or The Guardian or if it's from some random blog. Uh, and they found a very high failure rate. So uh, the suggestion that's coming forward is being debated in the US and elsewhere as well is, is perhaps we need to start that early, that perhaps bringing back a more refined, a more modern civics curriculum in, in schools so that um, citizens, as I think that word is very important, that, that that responsibility and the ability of a citizen to, to discern and then therefore make informed choices that determine the course of history uh, can be better made. So maybe that's one way to, maybe further down the road, I mean, we don't know if we can hope much from this uh, current U.S. Education Secretary, but uh, it's, it's longer term that may be one solution. Okay. I think, I think the greatest fear is that the, uh, the, the connection between the public and the media is getting really shattered. Um, and the responsibility of the media to speak the truth to the public um, or to its public, its audience, um, is being completely undermined. Um, and at the same time, uh, the politicians and people in power are really getting away with, a, 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 you know, um, uh, an enormous amount without being made accountable. Um, and this is a really very, very dangerous path. I mean, this is the path that dictators in the third world have, have had for many, many years. But now we are seeing it being exercised um, through technology and in, in, in countries where the media um, has been written into the constitution. 
as being, you know, under the protection um, uh, 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 of the state, as it were. And all this is changing so rapidly. Um, the very fact that President Trump, you know, as, as Narmeen said, as President Trump can get away with so much so early on in his term in office, um, literally within weeks, I mean, we, we, we've had Kellen Conway speaking about um, alternative facts, and so this has been challenged in the media, but of course, it's become now part of the lexicon uh, about media. And so I think, you know, we're, we're really entering a very, very dangerous phase. And I don't think we should be allowing, whether it's Pakistan, we should not be allowing our politicians to get away with these kinds of um, false narratives, uh, lies, um, uh, fake news, um, the things that are put out. I mean, the, the, as I said, the government is determined to prove that this bomb blast was a cylinder exploding, not a bomb. Now, that has been countered by all the media that certainly I've read, um, and, and yet the government is still persisting in this uh, demand that, you know, this was, this was a cylinder. Now, if, you know, people's lives, um, uh, uh, people's, people were killed, people died, and, and you are playing with people's lives um, through a desire to project um, a, a false narrative. And I think that is really um, abominable in, in, in the kind of world we're living in. But, sorry, Ahmed, on this, uh, on this point, I mean, uh, this uh, Lahore episode that happened and the, the shift in the narrative, I think the, the, the purpose of that, the motivation behind that fake news was fairly noble. I mean, they're trying to instill a sense of normalcy uh, we've got uh, the Pakistan Super League final on the 5th of March and we fervently want it to happen in Lahore and all of us hopefully will get to attend that as well. So is, is it still fake news if it serves a higher goal and it's not a naked power grab like Trump does? You know what I mean? Or well, Emmett? I think, I think the danger is that you're just confusing people. You know, I, I lecture a lot at universities and young people yeah, and um, I think there's so much confusion in people's minds as to who is a terrorist, what is terrorism, why are they doing this, um, is this really religiously motivated or motivated through the desire for power, uh, etc. People are really confused and I, 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 I just believe that, you know, it is the government's responsibility to put out an honest, a truthful narrative as to how we are supposed to counter this kind of extremism. And um, we're not doing it, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Can we handle the truth? Well, you know, I think it's, it's important, uh, the, the point uh, that Max made, namely that, you know, the distinction between the way uh, the news from an outlet like Pravda uh, was received um, uh, in, in the Soviet Union as against how we perceive news uh, by an outlet like the New York Times, the New York Times whose motto is all the news that's fit to print. And, and also to, to, to continue on, on Max's point, which is namely that what I think is, is crucial is to, to have a citizenry that is as skeptical uh, or critical of its leadership, of its media, as it is of its leadership. In other words, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that most people are, are likely to question more what comes from government officials than they are <clears throat> likely to question what comes from their preferred uh, media outlet. And as uh, the media becomes more and more geared towards catering to specific publics and audiences become narrower and narrower uh, in the outlets they focus on, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, more crucial uh, uh, than, it's, than it's ever been. I think one of the, one of the key troubles now is, is trying to find a way to uh, have both a free press uh, as free as possible because that's absolutely necessary to precisely perform the function that, that Ahmed is talking about uh, in, in uh, enlightening people and searching for the truth. But, but also uh, how to filter nonsense out of that. Uh, uh, and um, I just think it's, it's an extremely difficult task. We, d we don't need censors, absolutely not. 
Um, and you know, it's not it's not possible to rely entirely on the discerning citizen because, uh, as Ahmed was saying, and as I, as I mentioned about you know the sort of KGB approach of just simply scrambling up news so that no one knows which way is up anymore. Uh, in that sort of situation, it's difficult for the citizen to really understand at all. So you end up with a great deal of confusion. Uh, and often this is the kind of situation created by states where, where so, uh, security police, uh, secret police, whatever you call them, are, are overly powerful. Uh, so how does one go about that? Um, and I, I suspect that, that uh, some of this will be self-regulating. You know, that there will be, already you'll find things like, like you know, that there are uh, sort of truth filters, you know, popping up on the internet, which actually run news through them. And in fact, some Facebook is trying to do something. They're trying to, I mean, uh, Zuckerberg himself, the great you know, <laughs> maestro uh, uh, of, of Facebook, uh, has actually initiated a policy to find some way, which they haven't come up with yet, by the way, of uh, monitoring to a certain extent, or a bit more intensively, the kind of absolute fake news that, that, that pops up. Um, and uh, I, I wish I had the solutions to that, but I don't. Um, I'm not a Silicon Valley wizard myself, so I don't, I don't know exactly how. But I think that there needs to be a way to filter without smothering at the same time. I, I mean, technology saved Erdogan. Facebook Live saved Erdogan from the coup. You had all this fake news about, you know, Erdogan being jailed, everything, the army's taken over, and it was a. Uh, it was Periscope and it was Facebook Live, these two platforms that brought people out into the streets and uh, ruined Turkey, quite frankly, given what Erdogan is doing currently. Uh, yeah, so I think if we tr uh, try to wrap this around into uh, the tussle between technology and, and credibility and, and as well as the duty of, of what journalists are supposed to do, um, uh, like Max, I, I, I don't quite know how developed uh, the algorithms are at Facebook or Twitter or, uh, or, or on Google to kind of allow for such filtering to happen automatically for a consumer of news. Uh, but that does seem to be one way that uh, things are moving. And I think uh, one great thing that has come out of this entire cycle and the reason where uh, fake news is a topic at, a, at one of the country's uh, biggest, uh, the country's biggest, uh, Litfest is because people realize that it's a problem. Google's admitted that some searches were weeding out some websites or showing you results that you were likely to click on. That Facebook has admitted that you were being shown links that your friends were likely to click on or press like. That this is the kind of post that will generate extra retweets. So God were the chronological timelines, you were just shown what they thought you wanted to know or what you'd like. Uh, and, and I think we can't uh, you know, overstate the role that uh, the people who run technology and who make technology policy uh, are going to play in finding a solution, like Max said. Uh, you know, we were talking about Russia. Uh, uh, one of the things that Germany has done after the American electoral experience in 2016 is to say, yes, we're going to have a state crackdown. We're going to have, you know, employ legal uh, instruments to ensure that citizens aren't misled by what Max very uh, correctly described as entire armies and battalions of trolls uh, employed not just by people who are paid by a certain political front, but by nation states now. So, uh, so that's, the, that's where we're going. Whether or not we'll find a solution uh, in time for the French or German elections, which will, of course, have a major impact, but uh, we, we'll have to wait and see how long that takes and how long uh, citizens take to adapt, like uh, Mr. Rashid said. Uh, the pace is somehow sometimes so uh, it, it's difficult to comprehend the pace with which things are changing so policy will have to try to keep up interesting times uh, we're going to open uh, this up to a, a q and a session so if salam we have another solution because second i think uh, the russian and the syrian and the iranian they don't talk about
that you need for anti-propaganda of Russia with enemy person. The Syrian tragedy unfolds, for example, uh, uh, it was very, very clear that someone was very carefully manipulating a lot of information to, to, uh, from the, from, from, right from the origin uh, and quite professionally doing so. Um, and uh, a lot of fingers do, do point to, uh, to Russia in, in that. And it is extremely difficult to, com to combat. I mean, the best thing you can do is cast light on this. And there was actually an expose of this particular building in St. Petersburg because there was a defector who explained his whole routine, his whole life. I think it was in the Washington Post that had a long article about this. Um, so, so that does need to be, be exposed. Um, but uh, again, I think it's, it's one of these situations where you know, this kind of spreading of false propaganda is, is a quite an ancient art. I mean, it goes back to you know, medieval times, presumably. Uh, it's just that the, you know, whenever there's new technology, there's a disjuncture between its use, its capacities, and, and, and there's, a, there's always a dangerous moment. Uh, you know, if you think of something like nuclear technology, uh, well, a bomb went, a couple of bombs went off before <laughs> it was put back in a box and used merely for threat, we hope. Uh, and not actually used again. Um, so uh, 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 there's a kind of there, 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 some of these technologies that are being used for, for pernicious ends right now. Um, and I, I think uh, um, there are uh, to to go back to what we were saying about you know I, I mean one of the one of the reasons I think why why things have gotten a little bit out of hand with social media now is that these big companies like Google and Facebook and so on have been following uh, basically a commercial model where they're using algorithms developed by commercial companies to get their advertising more tailored to individuals and so on and so forth. And this is the way they've, this is the model they've used to, to, to spread, disseminate information. Just as you're saying that, that, that uh, uh, you know, you, you, you keep liking things, you like in a change of like, 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 because you're not really allowed to dislike stuff on Facebook. I mean, you can make a little funny bit, but I mean, it, it follows your likes, you know, and then you end up with a great pile of, undigested mush, you know? um, so, so uh, uh, um, I think some of these algorithms, al algorithms will, will, will have to change and people will have to grow more sophisticated. Uh, it was shocking to me also uh, uh, in covering Syria how, how many people that I would meet and said, I saw this thing on Russia today, it's extraordinary, you know, how the, 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 the and then they would accuse, accuse the other side of doing exactly what they're doing, you know, uh, and uh, they were, I mean, it's remarkably effective, really remarkably effective, but I, uh, uh, and with some tragic results, I'm afraid. Um, but it's just, you know, we hope for a correction, self-correction. Mike, anything? Um, you know, the reason why things are coming up in social media, I think there is no accountability of the mainstream media. And, and that's a point that, that um, I'd like to make. I mean, and case in point being the fake bomb blast on the main boulevard the other day, Thursday, I was standing there, heard nothing, tweeted about it. My sister-in-law phoning me, where are you, where are you, why aren't you? Are you at home, what's happening? Nothing, I haven't heard anything. She says, but I'm at the airport watching Geo News and there is a ticker saying Main Boulevard Bay Bomb Blast. So Geo News becomes the word, the, and Geo News reporter, Nikisse verify here. What happened, was there anywhere? And similarly, I mean, I think that it's in a similar way and it happened also about the email leaks of, of Hillary Clinton in New York, where the New York Times on the front page says, okay, it's going to be an FBI investigation, new investigation into her emails. A, a little media, I, I can't remember what it was, outlet ran the text of those actual emails. She telling, um, you know, her, her personal assistant, what was her name, Sats, uh, no, no, they were the Sorry? Um, yes, exactly. Talking about sharing a tub of ice cream. That was the nature of one of the emails. Uh, no, so the thing is, how about the accountability of mainstream media and who's doing that? The first part of your, uh, your question regarding the report of the bombing now, uh, uh, we do have a media regulator in Pakistan and uh, it, its job is to ensure that on paper uh, the media doesn't uh, do not just you know, cross its boundaries but uh, also respects the laws and, and does its duty properly. Uh, uh, as, as of this moment, uh, 31 TV stations have been issued notices and threatened uh, with uh, anything from fines to suspensions. But the problem is, here, I, I agree with you that there's, uh, uh, we're lacking a mechanism that effectively 
uh, holds the mainstream media accountable, both from the citizen side and from the, the policy side. Uh, we've had, you know, suspensions of TV licenses for as many as 30 days in the past. We've had people uh, facing fines of millions of rupees. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to deter them so far. If we look at the way uh, newsrooms and editorial uh, boards are run in this country, it's not exactly satisfactory. So uh, perhaps uh, we need to think about uh, the, the media itself, as, as, as people said. It's, it's not about censorship or control by the state, but uh, perhaps a, a, a realization, uh, just by looking at the panic that, that spread through Lahore, uh, through fake news, that perhaps we need to look at ourselves and and regain the trust and become uh, sources of records. I mean, you talk to anyone randomly on the street from any socioeconomic background, they'll tell you that this channel will report this about the government in a certain way and the other channel is going to do it another way. Uh, where does that leave, uh, you know, uh, that, that myth uh, or that uh, ideal of uh, an unbiased or as, as unbiased as possible media? So we'll have to, you know, it needs more work. I think one of the, I think one of the problems is that the, 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 it's not punitive enough. I mean, you know, finding the Pakistani news channels a few piddly lakhs is not going to change their behavior or make them sort of think twice about their standards. Uh, we've recently, in fact, had a landmark case relating to Pakistani media, but it happened in London. That is, uh, Mr. Mir Shakil Rahman, the owner of Geo, won a defamation case against the uh, ARY people. And uh, They've, ARY has been forced to liquidate their operations in London to escape the millions of pounds that they have to pay. It's, it's you know, damages like that that will force some correction. We have a person here who's been wanting to ask a question and then Noni. So, um, we've seen or heard three issues. The first issue being the generation and dissemination of news. We are okay, we can't solve that. But the two issues that Kasim raised, one was the higher standard for journalists, and the other is being discerning. I grew up in the Zia era. In the Zia era, and I was fortunate enough to have excellent teachers who taught me how to think. I think the issue here that we can look at is that of journalists. My friends, none of them I have met joined journalism for fame or money. They were the higher standards of people. Dare I say we need to see more proverbial deaths in the journalist arena to fix this problem. And I'd be really curious to see how you look at that aspect. I, I believe journalists are getting soft. They are, they are getting soft. Your question. Yes, my question is that here we are lamenting the fact that our leaders are using technology and they are the habitual liars, right? My question is that what I feel that human beings, they cannot handle the truth and they want to feel good about themselves and that is why they create an atmosphere in their surroundings where only their flatterers and psychophants, they can prosper and that is why, and we keep on accepting these liars as our leaders. And I am not uh, limiting my question only to the leaders in the political landscape. My question is also for the leaders at the organizational levels. Being an HR professional, I see in different organizations that only bullies and the people who are able to do their marketing and who are able to uh, project lies for the good of the people at the top, they prosper and they nourish. So there is something sort of a manufacturing defect in human beings that they are in the habit of listening to only sugar-coated lies. Thank you. I think that's what that's what Max was also saying. This is you you you're looking for people who revalidate your point of view, your position. You're just looking for like-minded, uh, you know, channels of news and information. Uh, we we're running out of time. Last last question. Yeah. Uh, we have to go. We have a lot of hands up, um, madam. 
Urdu on the ticker, it was saying it's a rumor. At the same time, in English, in fact, they were saying that there was an explosion at the same time, right? So, the same thing. In English, it's saying that there's an explosion. In Urdu, it's saying there's a rumor. I actually worked in New York City in breaking news during September 11th. In New York City, all of America can handle very extreme news. So, a place like Pakistan, I think they're very resilient. I think they can handle serious news. I think they can handle if there is a blast. I don't think they're going to fall apart hearing that there's a blast. I don't think they need to hear that there is, you know, a gas leak or something like that. So, I mean, why is it that it needs to be hidden? Why does it need to be sugar-coated? Why does something like that I think just to quickly wrap up, it's, it's difficult to speak to the motivations behind whoever came, comes up with the copy that we see on TV shows and, and uh, but uh, on the sure, internet. But, but it's, it's uh, I guess, you know, the government may have different reasons as Fassi outlined when we discussed. Uh, I think in this instance, it's a nobler reason. They, they want to ensure that they, I mean, the, the panic that day in Lahore two days ago was just ridiculous. And it wasn't just the rumor of the McDonald's uh, class. There was also one on Davis Road. So in all, there was supposed to be three that had gone on. And, you know, I mean, the scenes we saw on television that day, buildings being evacuated across the main boulevard, the rangers having, you know, taken over that place, schools being closed down. It was ridiculous. And I think it is important in that environment, in Pakistan's environment, where we've had these two terrible weeks all over the country, from Seven Sharif to Quetta to Peshawar, terrible two weeks. I think it is important to tell people, even if it's a lie, it's good to hear that it's going to be okay. It's not as bad as it actually is. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running over. We've got a vacate for other people. Sure. We'll have a conversation down, down there, but thank you very much. <laughs>